and some reflection afterwards. And you all notice that the big guns are quiet too. For the first time, these hills have been silent for more than three days. It doesn't mean there'll be no more fighting. We don't know what the position is in the other Argentine garrisons. But certainly, Stanley has surrendered and is about to be occupied by the British. It's taken ten weeks since we left Portsmouth, but this major objective has now been achieved. By the time I met Brian, he was already, because of all that, a household name. And I was struck by how grounded he was, how unself vaunting He seemed completely unimpressed by his own legend, his own celebrity. He was kind to me when I was first pitching up in foreign news, trying to make something of myself, and friendly and interested in what I was doing. But quietly, privately, almost shyly, Never any grandstanding from Brian. He was the opposite of the stereotype of the self-important, ego-driven television news reporter. Everything Brian did as a reporter was stamped with quality. We learned from him. He witnessed some of the defining world events of our lifetimes, as we're going to see in a minute. And he managed to convey the urgency of the situation, the drama, its moment, sometimes the sense that the hinge of history was turning without losing his own calm, wise detachment. The message was the thing for Brian, and not the messenger. He was never so presumptuous to think that he himself was somehow part of the story. Writing, writing for the spoken word, is a craft and not an art, and Brian was a master craftsman, the master craftsman of our time, I think. He did with what seemed like effortlessness, what we all tried to do, he made precise, clean, clear language carry enormous burdens of complexity and nuance and meaning and context in an accessible, easily digestible form. His prose style was fluid, drinkable, wonderfully free of cliché and arresting. He had an extraordinary ability to turn a phrase, it wouldn't even take a whole sentence from Brown that would make you see something that you thought you understood in a quite unexpected light. So when Brian was on, you stopped to listen because you knew he'd thought carefully about what he wanted to say. Brian was a thinker, turning things over in his mind, gnawing away at them quietly until they made sense to him and, and until he found a way to make you see what he could see. You knew when you listened to him that he'd made judgments about what he was hearing. His intelligence, his extraordinary intelligence, insinuated its way into everything he said. You knew he wouldn't balance a credible account with a ludicrous account. He knew that that was not balance at all. You knew that he'd have something to say about the quality of evidence upon which an assertion or an account of events was, was based, and that he would guide you through competing versions of the same event. He was editorially courageous, and astonishingly, almost never got it wrong. Martha Gellhorn wrote well about the duty of reporters to keep the record straight, the duty to be accurate. The act of keeping the record straight, of getting it right, is, she said, a form of honourable behaviour involving writer and reader. Brian was stubborn, somebody said to me yesterday, almost to the point of bloody-mindedness in his determination 
to be accurate. I think he thought getting it wrong was a form of dishonourable behaviour. Producers he worked with could get exasperated with him for this, but they loved working with him because he was a generous team man. When I sat down to try to write about Brian's professional achievements as a reporter, I found myself thinking instead about a different and more important kind of achievement, achievements of character. Because in Brian's case, I think these two are related. I sometimes go and talk to young recruits at the BBC College of Journalism, and they sometimes ask me what I think is the most important quality in a reporter. And I say, and I think it's respect. Respect for your colleagues, respect for your audience, and very often respect for the people you're interviewing or on whose lives you're reporting. People who have decided to trust you, to give a fair account of them. Brian had this quality more than anyone else I've known. He seemed to care about what was true, about what had really happened. He wanted to know what really happened. He wanted to understand what people were trying to say to him, with scepticism, distance, but always without cynicism. So I admired him not just as a journalist, but as a human being. I loved his natural, instinctive courtesy. He could be as scathing and grumpy about people he didn't approve of as anyone else, but never gratuitously, and never, it seemed to me, in a self-serving way. I'm reminded of Christopher Hitchens' definition of a gentleman <coughs> as someone who is never rude, except on purpose. <laughs> Brian was never accidentally rude. His courtesy, his gentility, his civility was to be admired. He was understated in a business that often promotes and rewards more abrasive character traits. None of us can make the world a better place, but Brian made the room he was standing in a better place. Nicer, more humane, more civilised. We're going to see in here now some more of the work that distinguished his amazing life. Another said he was a real team, team player, and that particular witness expanded a little. He said, travelling with Brian, you always felt that he was team leader, but in a very subtle way. Any team with him came together very quickly. He was a fantastic ambassador for the BBC, always leaving a story or a location with people there feeling positive. 